So in the second video of this theme, I will discuss this um, autocorrelation that we have uh, slightly touched upon in the previous theme and uh, how to test for autocorrelation and how to model autocorrelation in the, in the static model. But I will also then, then uh, discuss the connection to the dynamic models. So uh, you can remember perhaps this uh, slide from the previous video where I introduced the regression model using time series. Uh, so remember that uh, by static model, I mean this kind of uh, model where all these uh, y and x variables uh, are observed in the uh, same time period t, and there is not any explicit connection to other time periods. However, there can be implicitly some, uh, some uh, connections to other time periods through autocorrelated error term epsilon. So if the error term in period t correlates with the uh, error, error term epsilon in some other time period, so then we have this uh, 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 issue called autocorrelation, which is a violation of uh, one of those uh, Gauss-Markov assumptions. So that's one of the reasons why I want to discuss this uh, uh, case of autocorrelation to, to complete this uh, uh, discussion of the potential violations of the, of the classic OLS assumptions. But I will also then draw connection to the dynamic models, and by dynamic uh, I refer to models where this uh, um, regression equation uh, is explicitly having some kind of connections between different time periods. So we can have these uh, different time periods uh, entering the regression equation either by means of the lagged uh, x variables like in the first equation of the of the dynamic models or we can have also the lagged value of the dependent variable y in period t minus one as one of the explanatory variables. So when this kind of uh, connections between different time periods are modeled uh, explicitly as a part of the regression equation, I will refer to the dynamic model. So we need an empirical example to, to uh, discuss the autocorrelation. Uh, and I chose uh, this kind of interesting historical example, so-called um, sunspot theory of business cycle by uh, uh, classic uh, economist from the 19th century, uh, William Stanley Chevons. So Chevons um, was um, interested in the question that uh, what could cause uh, this kind of uh, cyclical behavior of economy, booms and recessions. So this kind of uh, uh, booms and recessions occurred already in the 19th century. And uh, this was a mystery for the for the classic uh, economic theory, which was kind of uh, supposed to converge to the stable equilibrium. So clearly in, in mind of Chevron's then there must be some kind of external cause, uh, some kind of external source for this kind of cyclical uh, behavior. And uh, astronomers had already found this kind of uh, sunspot cycle. So then, uh, then Chevron's was trying to explain the, the business cycle as the source of this kind of cyclical behavior of the of the solar radiation, which of course at the in the nineteenth century could uh, could affect the weather, and of course at uh, that time the agricultural production would be very very important uh, sector of the economy. So if there is some kind of uh, cyclical behavior in the weather due to solar activity, which would then affect the agricultural production, that could also then affect the price level and hence also the economy. So uh, interestingly, when I was reading the, about history of econometrics, then, then uh, this was actually trying to find some empirical support for, for this uh, sunspot theory. Jevons was one of the first to actually, first economists to, to resort to e empirical data and uh, start to use this kind of uh, actually data to support some, some of this kind of uh, armchair theoretizing. So in that sense, this would be kind of econometrics of 1870s revisited. I should also mention that uh, back then when Chevons was presenting the sunspot theory, he was uh, totally ridiculed by his colleagues. So, so that's also one of the reasons why this, uh, why this uh, sunspot theory hasn't really uh, been one of the most famous uh, works of Chevons. So, so it might sound completely 
uh, ridiculous uh, and it already sounded ridiculous at that time. But let's let's uh, investigate this. So I have uh, taken now um, for for Finland. I have I have the uh, inflation rate, uh, and I have I have taken it from the statistics Finland. I will use the uh, the GDP deflator. So how how the inflation adjustment is done for the gross domestic product? Uh, because for that kind of GDP deflator, I can get. Uh, uh, very long time series starting from 1861 to to uh, to uh, to have a very long time yearly time series of the of the inflation rate in Finland, and I will try to explain this inflation rate by the the international sunspot number by by NASA. So for that one actually there would be even monthly data, but but since for inflation rate it's yearly data, though, so I will have a yearly yearly time series model. So. The model I want to fit is just this kind of single single regression model. What differs from the earlier single regression models is just that it's it's uh, both x and y variable are, are time series data. And uh, here's just to illustrate you the 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 sunspot cycle or so sunspot uh, data. So as you can see, the sunspot number has this kind of very very much cyclical uh, behavior. It's uh, some seems to be something like 15 year period. So there are these kind of highs and lows periodically. And uh, seems that the lows are kind of uh, um, fairly stable, but highs can can fluctuate also also quite a lot. So this type of the, the sunspot cycle when Chevons was trying to fit, of course, when he was doing it in the 19th century, he didn't have so much uh, data available as we have nowadays for the sunspot cycle and also for the for the inflation, in fact. And notice also for when I was discussing about the stationarity. So anyway, this uh, cycle seems to be relatively stable. So, for example, we cannot see any kind of uh, uh, growth trend or decreasing trend in this sunspot cycle. So it's kind of fluctuating up and down, up and down. but the, there is not such kind of uh, systematic trend uh, over time, so that's important for the for the also for the use of the static model. So in this slide, I have then just applied the linear regression. So this is the stata output, but the same kind of regression we could do equally well in in Excel. So I have just used the the single regression model to explain inflation by the sunspot number. So here, this uh, variable uh, nine is this uh, sunspot number, and uh, by now you should be, of course, very comfortable to uh, read and interpret this kind of uh, regression results. So we see that the sunspot number has a very, very tiny but positive uh, coefficient, uh, and if you read uh, t statistic p-value or confidence intervals, uh, we also see that. Uh, the uh, sunspot number is a uh, significant e explanatory variable at 5% significance level. So, for example, you see that the p-value is uh, uh, 0 0.017. Of course, we also see that the R-squared statistic is uh, very low, so the, the sunspot number doesn't explain, uh, it explains less than 4% of the uh, variation in the inflation rate over time in the long run, but uh, but still uh, the regression as a whole is also statistically significant. So that's kind of interesting interesting result that even of course the this uh, uh, time period started in 1861. So so most of this sample period Finland has been also very highly agricultural society. So so perhaps indeed uh, solar activity has. Uh, has to, had uh, in, in, in a large proportion of this time period has been uh, important for the for the economy as a whole in Finland. So, but what about the possibility of autocorrelation? So, we can model it uh, using now with this uh, tool that I introduced in the previous video, namely this uh, autoregressive process. So now I have just replaced this random variable v by this epsilon. So we can think about this kind of first order autoregressive uh, uh, error term. So this implicitly makes this uh, this uh, 
um, uh, error terms uh, somewhat, somewhat dependent on the on the errors in the previous period. Okay, so I don't discuss now more in details of this AR1 process. You can see the previous video for more more details about the AR1 process. And uh, indeed, if we plot the the OLS residuals, we will see also that uh, there is some suggestion that perhaps there is some autocorrelation in the in the residuals. So notice that there are some especially high high peaks in this uh, these residuals. Uh, and uh, interestingly, those those high peaks they they occurred uh, uh, during the First World War in uh, around uh, nineteen uh, or actually uh, during and after the First World War um, when uh, Finland became independent in nineteen seventeen. Then there is the Second World War from uh, nineteen thirty nine to uh, nineteen forty five, and immediately afterwards also. And then you can see around 1975, there was the oil crisis. So at least the biggest peaks, we have quite natural explanation that why there was the, uh, why there was uh, very high inflation during those, those times. And perhaps this kind of crisis like, uh, like the world wars and the oil, oil, oil crisis uh, could be also modeled more explicitly. But uh, perhaps more alarmingly, uh, we see that when there is some kind of uh, positive or negative shock uh, uh, in the residuals, then these residuals tend to stay positive for a long time, or they stay negative uh, for a long time. So we might suspect that there is some some autocorrelation there in the, in this based on this picture. So this is kind of like visual inspection of possibility of autocorrelation. But if we want to then test more specifically, then uh, then we need to need to have some kind of model so we can use similar kind of uh, approach as in the case of heteroscedasticity so remember that uh, that autocorrelation and uh, heteroscedasticity are very closely related they both relate to the to the covariance matrix of the of the error term epsilon so now in this in this specific test we we take as the null hypothesis that there's no autocorrelation and as an alternative hypothesis, we need to have some kind of a statement about what kind of a, a autocorrelation there is. And uh, we assume that uh, uh, we can assume that the disturbances are uh, first order autocorrelated. Uh, so we have then this AR1 model. And uh, therefore, we can, we can start from this uh, static model that we have fitted just before and saving the residuals E. And then in the second step, they then take these residuals and we fit the, the model where we explain the residual in period T by the residual in previous period. Uh, and uh, then, then therefore the coefficient, estimated coefficient would be then a uh, measure of the autocorrelation. We can also include constant term, uh, but that's not so important. We can also skip it. And then we can just use the usual T test to test that is this coefficient of this uh, lacked residual in the second step uh, uh, significant or not. Okay, so that's kind of intuitive way of uh, testing if, there, if the residuals are uh, autocorrelated according to this AR1 model. And uh, so I have done that just with the OLS regression. Here is the stata output, but this could be done equally well in Excel, of course. So I have just taken the OLS residual and I have explained it by the lacked value of OR, OLS residual. So that's the exploratory variable here. I excluded the, the constant term, and here is what we get as the coefficient. Uh, we see that the coefficient is positive, so that would indicate positive autocorrelation in line with this uh, graphical illustration. And we find that the estimated uh, autocorrelation coefficient is uh, 0 0.717, and it's also uh, significantly different from zero. So this is a simple way of testing and we find that there is uh, there is indeed, uh, according to the AR1 model, there is significant autocorrelation present in the, in the regression residuals. So um, now it's a good moment to pause and think about, okay, what is then the problem with autocorrelation that uh, 
Uh, remember that uh, that even if we have autocorrelation in the in the residuals or in the error term, um, this uh, doesn't really make the OLS estimate of the static model uh, biased or inconsistent. However, it might be inefficient, and uh, and these uh, standard errors would be biased. So we cannot really rely on this uh, this result that uh, some spot number would be. Uh, statistically significant ex uh, estim statistically significant explanatory variable because uh, uh, these uh, standard errors were subject to autocorrelation, so they would be biased. So what can we then do for the for the autocorrelation? Then, of course, this kind of um, AR one model is then quite a natural way to to model auto autocorrelation. If you found that there is significant uh, uh, autocorrelation in terms of AR1 model, then we can also exploit it to, to deal with autocorrelation. So the classic Cochrane awkward procedure would then also, also make this kind of data adjustment like we did in the case of uh, generalized least squares. So, so this is totally in the spirit of the generalized least squares. Uh, so we make this kind of adjustment, but, uh, but in the case of the Autocorrelation, the adjustment is slightly different than in the case of the heteroscedasticity. So recall that in the heteroscedastic case, uh, we, we divided by the uh, estimated uh, uh, standard deviation of the error term. In the case of autocorrelation, we can use this kind of partial differences. So we have made this kind of, uh, uh, on this slide, I make this kind of um, data transformation that I will use uh, uh, y asteric and x asteric and uh, i will then make this kind of partial difference where we where i take uh, for example for variable y i take y imperial t and i subtract the uh, row times uh, y imperial t minus one and same i do for the x variable so i will eliminate this autocorrelation both in y and x variable so now here is of course one one thing that we don't know exactly what is this uh, true row but we can then use this estimated row from the previous uh, state. So we have then estimated autocorrelation coefficient. So we can make this kind of uh, data transformation. And then, then we can, uh, we can uh, then fit the, the OLS regression to, the, to this data of uh, uh, Y asteric and S X asteric, where I have done already this elimination of the autocorrelation. So this is, uh, in some sense, the uh, Sim in similar to the generalized least squares procedure that we did for the heteroscedasticity, so this makes this kind of autocorrelation correction for our data. So we can do it sep separately in in uh, make this cor correction for this uh, y asteric and x asteric, and then use uh, use uh, OLS regression. But uh, there is also in uh, uh, Stata there is this kind of uh, uh, this specific function, I believe it is this praise uh, function, but it does this kind of Cochrane awkward autoregressive regression. And uh, here is then the, the, the result. So it's, it's actually automatically also fitting this, uh, this um, uh, autocorrelation coefficient row. So notice that, uh, that uh, now this row is uh, almost the same as we had in this uh, when we were testing for the for the autocorrelation, but not exactly the same because it's part of this kind of fitting procedure also. So, so notice that Stata does this kind of uh, stepwise iteration, but almost the, almost the same. So now when we when we do correct for the uh, autocorrelation using this Cochrane awkward procedure, uh, notice that the, the R squared statistic of the regression is uh, slightly lower. So now the sunspot number uh, explains only about 2% of the uh, inflation rate. Um, the coefficient is positive, but very, very small. And now we come to this kind of quite intriguing finding that, uh, that, uh, that the impact of uh, sunspot number, it's uh, not statistically significant at 5% uh, significance level, which is the usual kind of significance level. But if we go, if you are willing to increase the significance level to ten percent, so we could conclude that the, the sunspot number is almost significant. So the p-value is zero point zero seven nine. That's also the the uh, significance level of the regression as a whole. 
So if we, if we stick to the usual, usual level of significance, 5%, we can conclude that the, that the sunspot number is not significant explanatory variable for the inflation rate in Finland. Uh, but uh, if it would, we could still conclude that it's almost significant. So, so it kind of leaves still the door open for some, some uh, few f further investigation. For example, we could uh, model this, uh, these world wars and other, other shocks more explicitly and try to see that if that, it would, could be possible that the sunspot number loses its meaning by that kind of additional variables, or it would become more more highly significant. So we don't, we don't know that based on this, this result, it kind of leaves it, leaves it still a little bit open. So now I want to, want to make a, still a connection to the dynamic model. So, so notice also that uh, we can also model explicitly the connections, uh, uh, rather than use this autocorrelation, we could also model more explicitly the dynamics uh, between the explanatory variables. And in fact, uh, I want to here refer to the uh, paper by Meisen in uh, 1995 in Journal of Econometrics. Uh, so the title of the paper is a bit provocative, uh, a note to autocorrelation correctors don't, meaning that, uh, that uh, he's suggesting that uh, it's not a good idea to use this kind of cochrane awkward procedure to correct for the autocorrelation, but rather Meisen's uh, suggestion is to use just the dynamic model to, to take this uh, uh, autoregressive process uh, explicitly into account rather than hide it in the error term. And uh, in that paper, Meisen actually shows uh, formally that the static model with uh, AR1 disturbances is in fact completely equivalent to a dynamic model where there is no autocorrelation in the error term, but, uh, but this kind of uh, Autoregression is explicitly modeled through the uh, lacked value of the dependent variable y. So I think it's quite uh, simple to show this proof. So I have here sketched the uh, the idea, and uh, you can also verify that uh, by by taking paper and pen. So I'll just give you some hints how to how to show this equivalence. So. Notice that I first first have uh, indicated this AR1 process, and uh, as the first step of the of the proof, I, I have just written out this uh, this epsilon. Uh, so epsilon we can of course substitute by um, epsilon in period t. We can substitute by rho times epsilon in period t minus one plus u in period t. So now we have this uh, this uh, white noise term u explicitly as our error term. And then a second part of the blue, which I have indicated now with blue color, notice that by, by writing this first regression equation, we know that the epsilon in period t is, can be stated as uh, y in period t minus uh, beta 1 minus beta 2 times x in period t. So the same applies also in period t minus 1. So epsilon in period t minus 1 is equal to y in period t minus 1 minus beta 1 minus beta 2 times x in period t minus 1. Okay, so now what I have done is then I take this uh, this uh, static model where I have writ written this, uh, this uh, red part, this rho times epsilon in period t minus 1 plus u in period t, and now I just substitute this epsilon in period t minus 1 with this blue equation that we developed earlier. So, then by we, we see that uh, that uh, indeed uh, we we have uh, we can get completely rid of this epsilon terms and what we have as an error term we have just this white noise term u and uh, it reorganizing the terms we have actually the dynamic model so in that sense this is actually quite important uh, because uh, if we have some autocorrelation in our error term epsilon uh, rather than modeling it, uh, this autocorrelation through this error term, we can actually introduce these dynamics more explicitly by using this kind of lacked, uh, lacked dependent variables and lacked values of the exponentory variable. So, in some sense, uh, Meisen's argument is that why should we, uh, why should we have this kind of static model and hide this kind of uh, 
connections between time periods to the to the error term why not just uh, model it explicitly as a part of the regression equation so we can then then uh, also then then uh, i i will i will next uh, go back to this uh, sunspot uh, number and it, it illustrate it but uh, in some sense if this ar1 model of the error term and static model is uh, is a special case of the of the specific dynamic model then we can have a, a even even little bit more general model if we if we if we take this kind of uh, so called ardl model so auto regressive uh, distributed lag model so this blue equation on the bottom part of the slide notice that uh, i have here introduced this uh, auto regressive part so the auto regressive part is this raw times y in period t minus 1 and uh, in this notation of time series, this ARDL, so this first number one refers to the order of the autoregressive part. Okay, so here in this terminology, this AR refers to this how many time lags we have for the dependent variable Y. And then the second number in this ARDL11 refers to the how many lags we have for the explanatory variable X. So in this case, we have also one, one time lag for the, for the explanatory variable X. And notice now that if we have this uh, static model with the, with the error term uh, autocorrelated according to the AR1 process, then uh, we have some specific structure for the, so this row would also in, influence the constant term, and this row would also influence the coefficient of this uh, uh, lack value of, of x. So we, we have this, uh, in fact, this uh, beta 3 of the blue equation would be equal to minus beta 2 times rho. So then we could also then, of course, apply some statistical tests to test that uh, we, could, uh, we could estimate this ARD model and test that is it, uh, do these coefficients match with the special case of the, of the static model. So it's also possible to test for the static model as a parameter restrictions and sort of as a restricted special case of the ARDL model. But let's get to, then to the empirical example and uh, test also how does it, how would this ARDL model work? So now notice that uh, if we have this ARDL model where this uh, dynamics are modeled explicitly, so there is no, no longer any, any reason to uh, assume some autocorrelation. Of course, we could still test if there's autocorrelation present in this ARDL model, and if necessary, then we could add more, more lags uh, for X variables or, or Y variables. So we can have then increase the order of the autoregression or the distributed lag part. Okay. So here's the results of the ARDL model in this uh, case where explain inflation with the sunspot number. So the purpose of this example is to illustrate then how the ARDL model would look like. So I have denoted the inflation by variable eight and variable nine is the sunspot number. So now we explain this inflation rate. We take, uh, take the sunspot number before, but we also take the uh, sunspot number in the previous period. And we also take inflation rate in the previous period as explanatory variables. And again, this is just the OLS regression. I have done it in Stata, but this could be equally well done in, in Excel or whatever software you might want to use. And uh, firstly, let's, uh, let's pay attention to the, um, this uh, inflation rate in the previous period. So that is variable eight, uh, and then there is this uh, lack of one period. So the coefficient is now 0.718. And that's slightly bigger, almost the same as in this, uh, when we were testing for autocorrelation in the, in the residuals of the static model. So now this kind of, when we model this uh, uh, explicitly uh, with this ARDL model, the autocorrelation coefficient is almost the same, just slightly higher. And we also find that this uh, uh, autoregressive part is uh, statistically significant. What about then this X variable sunspot number and, it, and its lagged value? 
So now we find that this variable nine, so that's the sunspot number in period T. It has very small coefficient, but it's positive. Uh, but interestingly, then the lagged value of the sunspot number, so sunspot number in the previous period, which is this variable nine, and uh, with one period lag, so that gets a negative coefficient. And uh, both, both this variable nine in, in period T and period T minus one, uh, they are not significant at 5% significance level, but they would be significant at 10% significance level. So again, we have this uh, kind of intriguing case that, uh, that uh, we could interpret it as, as not significant with the conventional statistical significance levels of 5%. Uh, but this kind of almost significant uh, uh, result kind of leaves still the room for some speculation. So perhaps if we, if we introduce additional explanatory variables, uh, uh, perhaps model this kind of uh, uh, special circumstances such as world wars or oil crisis explicitly, perhaps the sunspot number would become uh, more significant. Of course, we should also remember that we have a relatively small number of observations, even though it's quite a long, a long historical time series, it's still only 151 observations. So perhaps also using more, uh, perhaps a panel data of uh, many countries would kind of give more, more conclusive evidence in favor or against the, the this Chevon's uh, theory of some spot numbers, but, uh, but that's kind of, uh, Kind of intriguing that it's it's uh, almost significant. Uh, um, actually, when I when I started to develop this uh, this uh, example, I I was kind of uh, uh, fairly sure that, that that I could I could uh, completely kill this uh, Chevron's theory. But uh, but uh, uh, at this stage, uh, we need to leave it to this kind of somewhat inconclusive state. So it depends on your significance level. Uh, again, at the usual significance level sunspot number is not significant, but it's still almost significant. So I will still continue with the sunspot example in, in one of the last uh, lessons, but as the next topic, then uh, I will discuss with you the unit root uh, econometrics. So we will go to this kind of uh, stochastic trends and uh, situations where the, where, the, where the variables are not stationary. So that's also an important topic in time series econometrics. Thanks and uh, see you on the next video.